George MacDonald might have done a good many other things with his life had there been more time to do them. He was a pretty fair carpenter and a fine leather worker. One of his hobbies was making new bindings for old books. He could read German, French, Italian, Dutch, Greek, Latin, and Spanish, and could have easily spent his days immersed in translator's work. His first published literary effort was a translation of the German poems of Novelis, which MacDonald published himself in a small run for friends and family in 1851. In 1876, Strahan published his translations again of Novelis, along with songs and poems by Luther, Heine, Guter, and others from both German and Italian. MacDonald had two thorns in his side, bad lungs due to constant bouts with bronchitis and asthma, which made physical labor difficult, and the complete lack of common sense among those who sat in positions of authority at the church he was pastor of for such a short time, and it was because of these adversities that he became a writer. In his younger years, despite his damaged lungs, he was said to have been quite an athlete, a swift and cunning boxer. Starting in the mid-1870s, he was able to live in Italy during the winter months. This did wonders for his lungs and brought new vigor to him, as can be seen in this photograph taken on or slightly before 1879 of George MacDonald with several of his sons and a friend standing against a rocky hillside in Italy, and although in his late 40s, MacDonald still looks like the best athlete in the bunch, with an obvious boxer's build about him. would die of tuberculosis later that year. Wolfred Dodgson, the brother of Lewis Carroll, taught McDonald's daughter Mary to box. She was a very athletic girl, but sadly, tuberculosis, or consumption as it was called in those days, would also take her life a short time later. A few years more, their daughter Caroline Grace would also succumb to TB, as would her only child at the age of nine. The McDonald's would also live to see their eldest daughter Lily die before them, again of TB. It would go on to take the lives of their daughter-in-law and even some of their grandchildren. They began to refer to tuberculosis as the family attendant. Despite his success as a writer, McDonald would struggle financially most of his life. There was a split in the ownership of one of his publishers, after which, despite selling more of them now, he found he could not get nearly as much for his books as he had years earlier. Louisa would die in 1902, three years before her husband. The deaths of his wife and his daughter Lily particularly traumatized him. Yet he would always talk of how very little adversity he had faced in life, as though he were specially blessed among men. His final years would have a bleakness in them, however. His mind became increasingly foggy, and he stopped writing altogether in 1897. About the same time, he came down with a severe skin disease that was so painful he could barely sleep for two full years. It's not known exactly what occurred, some think it was a stroke, but around 1900 he lost his ability to talk and never regained it. The only blessing it seemed was that, with the loss of his voice, his skin condition cleared up, he was able to sleep again, and his mind became brighter. Still, he quietly awaited his death, seldom leaving the house for the last seven years of his natural life. But though full of sadness, he never lost his faith that there was a greater good coming to him, something too good for him to know, as he so often would write. Greville tells us that he appeared to be waiting for his wife to come through the door one final time, to take him to his true home and that whenever anyone came to the house, he would look up with anxious eyes to see who it was, and once having seen that it was not his beloved Louisa, would let out a sigh and go back to his vigil. One could not help but be reminded of the closing words of Lilith through the voice of Mr. Vane as he looks forward to his time of departure 
when he will see his Lona once again. George McDonald went to his rest at nearly 81 years of age, September 18, 1905. And while much of his contemporary Scotland doted on his novels during his lifetime, many years later, through influential authors like G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis, it was his fantasy stories, his fairy tales for children and adults alike, that would finally take the forefront in the public's admiration, just as he believed they eventually would. A centenary celebration was held in 1924 in honor of what would have been George MacDonald's 100th birthday. G.K. Chesterton was chairman of the event. While a program survives showing all the featured speakers and singers, some of them MacDonald's own sons and daughters, we have no transcription of all the wonderful speeches and anecdotes that must have been presented that day. We can imagine, though, that Chesterton's wit would have been at full throttle, and he might well have, at some point, given a humorous talk on the importance of fairy stories, such as this from his essay, The Dragon's Grandmother. I listened to what he said about society politely enough, I hope, but when he incidentally mentioned that he did not believe in fairy tales, I broke out beyond control. Man, I said, who are you that you should not believe in fairy tales? It is much easier to believe in Bluebeard than to believe in you. A Bluebeard is a misfortune, but there are green ties which are sins. It is far easier to believe in a million fairy tales than to believe in one man who does not like fairy tales. I would rather kiss Grimm instead of a Bible and swear to all his stories as if they were 39 articles than say seriously and out of my heart that there can be such a man as you, that you are not some temptation of the devil or some delusion from the void. Look at these plain, homely, practical words. The dragon's grandmother. That is all right. That is rational almost to the verge of rationalism. If there was a dragon, he had a grandmother. But you, you had no grandmother. If you had known one, she would have taught you to love fairy tales. You had no father, you had no mother. No natural causes can explain you. You cannot be. I believe many things which I have not seen, but of such things as you it may be said, Blessed is he that is seen, and yet is disbelieved. McDonald's sons Greville and Ronald, one a physician, the other a schoolmaster, would also go on to author several books. They never reached the success their father had, but Ronald's son Philip would go to Hollywood in 1931 and become one of the most successful detective novelists and screenwriters ever. He wrote stories for such notable characters as Charlie Chan, Mr. Muddle, and even Perry Mason, while also doing stories and screen adaptations for John Ford, Alfred Hitchcock, John Huston, and Agatha Christie, among scores of others. His last great novel, The List of Adrian Messenger, would become a classic film of the 1960s, starring such well-known screen actors as Tony Curtis, Burt Lancaster, Robert Mitchum, Kirk Douglas, and Frank Sinatra. He also trained equestrian steeplechase horses and raised Great Danes. Philip died in 1980, having kept the McDonald legacy of writers a long and healthy one. The world may never see another one like it, but just maybe, one is enough. <laughs>